Hello and welcome back to Financial Madness, where we look at all things personal finance. Following the rumours that ISIS are due to get a major shakeup in the upcoming autumn statement, I thought now would be a good time to revisit the classic individual savings account to understand how they work and if it's worth it, and what are the expected changes to come this year. I'm Kozan from Financial Madness, helping you be better with your money. Bow. So what is an ISA? It stands for an Individual Savings Account. The best way to describe what an ISA account is for those who are unfamiliar is to imagine it as a bubble where you put all your money away in the form of cash or investments like company stocks. This bubble acts as a shield to protect you from all future tax charges that you could be faced with. Alternatively, if you put your money into a regular account such as a savings account with your bank or a general account for your investments instead, then taxes may apply. Let's quickly go over which tax charges the ISA protects you from. Let's start off with if you held your money as cash. Did you know that the interest you earn in your savings account is taxable? So most of us do have something called a personal savings allowance, which allows us to earn a certain amount of interest before being charged tax. If you are a basic rate tax holder, the allowance is £1,000 per tax year. For higher rate earners, it's £500. And if you're an additional rate earner, then you don't get any allowance whatsoever. So any interest you'll earn will be subject to tax. And the tax you are subject to will be in line with whichever income tax bracket you fall under. So basic income earners will be charged 20%, higher rate 40% and additional rate 45%. Now you are probably familiar with earning interest via your bank and building society account, which is subject to this tax rule. But interest earned from the following also apply. So savings and credit union accounts, unit trusts, investment trusts and open-ended investment companies, peer-to-peer -peer lending, trust funds, payment protection insurance or PPI, government or company bonds, life annuity payments, and some other life insurance contracts as well. The next tax the ISA is also trying to protect you from is when you hold investments. Whenever you sell or realize any gains or profits from your investments, you can be subject to something called capital gains tax. Investment examples can range from second properties, stocks, bonds, etc., etc. Now we do have an allowance in capital gains, which is massively being cut by the current government which recently reduced from £12,300 per year to £6,000 per tax year, with a further reduction expected next year to reduce the allowance to £3,000. The amount of tax you pay in capital gains does vary and can range from 10% all the way to 28%, with factors being your income and the type of asset you're realising gains on. Here is a table from Tax Scout that illustrate this quite clearly. One thing to clarify is that the additional rate taxpayers follow the same rules as higher rate taxpayers. Now, before we move on, a quick mention to the sponsor of today's video. Plum is a digital app that can help you kickstart and progress your financial journey. Plum offers a multitude of key fundamentals that help you invest in funds and stocks within a stocks and shares ISA or a general investment account. You can even contribute to your own private pension. Link your bank account and the app helps you understand where your money is going. Plus, it has this amazing automated feature which tracks your spending habits and suggests how much you can actually invest using their algorithm, which will automatically set money aside for you to begin investing. So you don't even have to do anything. You can also rack up your investments by rounding up any spare change whenever you spend money. And you can set it up so it automatically sets money aside for you after you've just been paid. All this helps you achieve the goal of paying yourself first, which in personal finance terms is an investment fundamental 101. And it is all done with this clean and intuitive application. They've also recently introduced a new cash management option called Plum Interest. This is an easy access, low risk investment account with no minimum deposit required. And you can earn a 4.99% return today allowing you to earn at a return that is closer to the Bank of England base rate, which currently stands at 5.25%. So it's a no brainer. Download Plum using my access link down below and get started for free. Thanks again, Plum, for sponsoring this video. Now back to the content. With the tax scenario explained, we can better understand the key benefits of having an ISA account. Remember that bubble analogy that I was saying earlier? So any assets you put in within this ISA bubble are exempt from personal savings tax and capital gains tax. You can earn however much you want in profits and interest and it will never be subject to any tax whatsoever, nor would it count towards your allowances as well. So that means your personal savings and capital gains allowance is still available to be used towards other assets that you may not want or can't add to an ISA account. Something you may also want to do is um, 
hit that subscribe button. ISA really appreciate it. <laughs> ISAs have always proved useful for long-term investors who seek to invest over a long period of time and may be concerned with a hefty tax bill at withdrawal. And now this has proved even more useful with the slash of capital gains tax allowance from 12,300 to 6,000 and soon to be 3,000. But now another big game changer is with respect to cash ISAs. With historically low interest rates, most savers would have had to have held a lot of cash before even coming close to breaching the personal savings allowance. However, with the steady increase in interest rates, that no longer is the case. This report from AJ Bell suggests that the number of individuals set to pay tax on savings is set to increase by another million this year. To put this into a bit of perspective, if we look at this personal savings account calculator and we take the average saving rate from the year 2020, which was 0.2%, we can see a person would need it to have held more than half a million in savings to breach the £1,000 savings allowance. If we change that to 5%, which is now achievable in today's market, you can see a person now needs to only hold more than £20,000 to breach the limit and only £10,000 for higher rate earners a figure that is far more achievable. So to summarize, I would definitely say it's worth having an ISA or contributing more to your ISA as much as possible, especially as we go through this period of high interest rates and stagnated and reduced tax allowances. But there are some rules when it comes to opening up an ISA account. So the key one is that you can only contribute 20,000 pounds to ISA accounts within a tax year. The allowance is non-refundable, which means once you use it, you can't get it back. And if you don't use it within the tax year, it doesn't roll over to the subsequent tax year. You can only have one type of ISA account open in your portfolio. So just as a rewind, we've actually only covered two types of ISAs in the ISA family, and that is the cash ISA and the investment ISA. But there are actually two other types too. You have your lifetime ISA or LISA, which is designed to be used to buy your first property and or to be used for retirement. And then you have the innovative finance ISA, which is a tax efficient way to earn interest through peer to peer lending. So those are the four ISA types that make up the ISA family. And you can only hold one account for each type of ISA. You can't have two cash ISAs open at the same time, for example. But you can, however, transfer ISA accounts. Say you did want to open another cash ISA account because another provider is offering a better deal. You can coordinate with your provider to transfer the cash from your current cash ISA into your new one. So those are the rules at play today, but they are heavily rumored for a shakeup in the upcoming autumn statement, which is due to take place on the 22nd of November. Here are some of the heavily rumored proposals, which hopefully will get clarified in the next week or so. The first proposal is to merge the concept of cash and stocks and shares ISAs under one ISA account roof. So instead of individuals having to settle for the fact that any money in a cash ISA must be kept as cash and any money in a stocks and shares ISA has to be invested, they will now have the option to flexibly move money as being held as cash or within an investment. The idea behind this is to help tackle the issue that the majority of cash held within ISAs are within cash ISAs, which have been massively underperforming compared to their stocks and shares ISA counterparts. So the idea of having cash in one ISA account, which can easily be chosen to be kept as cash or invested in the market, might help encourage individuals to make that step forward into the investment world. Another discussion on the table is whether there should be an additional ISA allowance when investments are made to help the government support the British economy. It would be interesting to see how they would even implement this without making ISAs even more confusing. The third is regarding the future of fractional shares and its place within ISAs. Now this topic has actually been gaining a lot of traction and also looks the most plausible. Unfortunately, this would actually be an unfavorable change for investors to the ISA framework. Fractional shares, if you don't know, are when individual company shares are divided into smaller chunks. So instead of earning one share of Apple, for example, you own 20% of one share for Apple. Fractional shares have gained immense popularity in recent years as it has effectively reduced the barriers to entries for any investors wanting to get a slice of a company share which is outside of their financial reach. For example, Apple currently stands around about the $175 mark per share. A fractional share of 20% would cost the investor $35 instead. Since their introduction, they have been considered applicable to be held under the ISA umbrella, and therefore any dividend or gains earned from these fractional shares are not subject to tax. However, for some reason, regulators have been challenging the fact that fractional shares actually do not comply with what is allowed to be within an ISA, 
and therefore want to stop individuals investing in fractional shares under this ISA bubble. If this does happen, what the implications mean for investors who have fractional shares and have already realized any gains has yet to be made clear. But hopefully if this does go through, then hopefully we will understand how this will work in the autumn statement. And finally is the relaxation of the lifetime ISA rules, which could see it potentially be made available to anyone, not just if you are between the ages of 18 and 40 as it stands currently. It is also being discussed that if you do decide to withdraw from your LISA account, you will be charged a 20% penalty fee rather than the current 25%. Whilst on the topics of LISA, I personally hope they reconsider the maximum spending limit on first homes, which currently stands at £450,000 for first time buyers anywhere in the UK. This limit is in desperate need of an update, especially if you live in an expensive area like London. So how do you apply? There are plenty of providers that offer ISA accounts. A quick Google search will provide you with many options that will include the likes of Plum, Vanguard and many others. Ensure you spend time understanding what each of these platforms offer, look at their fees and what works best for you. Cool, so that is it for this week's episode. Let me know if you do have any questions down below and remember to like and subscribe. See ya. Bye.